This marks the 16th part of this manhua. If you haven't viewed the previous parts, you can access it by clicking the i button located above or the link is provided in description. Let's aim for 200 likes on today's video. To show your support consider subscribing to the channel. Let's begin our recap video for today's manhua. After some time, Gerald D. Rubin, the sixth prince of the Rubin kingdom, paid a visit to Randall County. Upon his arrival, Hudson D. Randall, the Count of Randall, greeted him with an apology, explaining that he had not been informed of the prince's visit in advance and therefore could not prepare accordingly. Prince Gerald reassured Count Randall that it was unnecessary to apologize, as he did not expect any special preparations for his visit. The Count expressed his gratitude for the prince's understanding. The prince then shifted the conversation to a pressing matter, stating his desire to discuss it immediately despite his wish for a more relaxed conversation. He mentioned that he had heard about a ban on gate entry requested by the Randall family, specifically affecting the first night, and asked for clarification on the situation. Count Randall explained that the gate entry ban was a strategic decision aimed at efficiently managing the gates and the capital. He clarified that this measure was taken in consultation with the capital god and was not exclusive to the first night, but applied to all knighthoods. Prince Gerald D. Reuben acknowledged Count Randall's dedication to the capital's security but emphasized the critical nature of the current situation, where every soldier's contribution is vital. He declared that the gate entry ban would be completely lifted, allowing all knighthoods and mercenary groups to defend the capital. Gerald assured that he would personally inform the Capital Guard commander, and instructed Count Randall to leave gate control to the Capital Guard. Count Randall complied with the Prince's orders. However, as Prince Gerald departed, Count Randall's frustration and anger surfaced. He felt disrespected by the Sixth Prince and internally fumed, vowing that Prince Gerald, the First Knight Ashton, and others would soon regret their actions. Meanwhile, the First Knight's party, having entered the gate, was engaged in combat with monsters. Jake expressed frustration over the narrow terrain hindering his ability to wield his sword freely, while Philip noted that at least they couldn't be surrounded. Pierce encouraged his team to stay focused, reminding them that the terrain would remain challenging for a while. Jake commented on how well Nokia was managing in the narrow space despite the challenging terrain. As Nokia stumbled, Josh quickly caught her, advising her to be careful. Nokia thanked him, and Josh offered his help whenever needed. Observing this, Jake remarked that Josh needed to get himself together. Roel noted the difficulty of traversing the sea rank gates terrain, which consumed a lot of stamina. He mentioned that he was able to enter the gate due to his favor with the capital god but, since the operation was unofficial, he couldn't bring many members. He acknowledged Nokia's valuable contribution to their forces, but worried that everyone would be exhausted before the raid even began. Roel was uncertain about the usefulness of taking a break due to the terrain. At that moment, Nokia suggested taking a short break to help everyone recover. Philip asked for clarification on how she intended to help them recover. Nokia revealed that she had brought a stamina recovery potion she made, explaining that while it might not be as effective as those from the monastery, it would still be beneficial. She handed the potion to Jake, who, before she could stop him, drank the entire bottle in one go. Jake immediately felt an overwhelming surge of power. Nokia explained that the potion was concentrated and could have been shared among them. Fortunately, she had brought an extra bottle. Pierce remarked that Jake often acted impulsively due to his muscular, less thoughtful nature. Roel was impressed that Nokia had made a potion typically requiring divine power from a certified priest using only alchemy. He realized that bringing Nokia along had been a wise choice, as they could now move forward without concerns. With their energy restored, Roel suggested they continue their mission. Jake enthusiastically agreed ready to face any guardian or challenge ahead. Philip asked Nokia if she had a potion to silence someone. Nokia replied that she did not have such a potion. Meanwhile, a D-rank gate guardian, the Lion Mane Borman champion, level 77, rank B, 
with traits such as being armed, having deformed molars, and a mane, observed the group from a distance. At one of Reuben Kingdom's prisons, Vice President Gray approached the guards on duty, thanked them for their hard work, and requested to interrogate the prisoner alone. The guards complied and left. Gray then approached the cell holding an imperial hound and questioned the prisoner's loyalty to the empire. The imperial hound mocked Gray, suggesting his acting was poor and challenged him to reveal his true self. Gray's appearance began to change, revealing himself to be Kane, the faceless master of the Information Guild. Acknowledging the Imperial Hound's skills, Kane admitted understanding why his guild had crumbled before them and prepared to start the interrogation. The Imperial Hound mocked Kane, dismissing his intention to conduct an interview and calling it a farce. He taunted Kane, suggesting that interrogation through threats or torture wouldn't yield any useful information. Kane sighed, acknowledging that while those methods might be tempting, he couldn't use them. He explained that he was no longer part of the Information Guild Wing of Freedom but had joined the First Night, which followed strict rules against torture. The Imperial Hound laughed at the irony, ridiculing Kane for becoming a dog of a nobleman playing knight. He sarcastically encouraged Kane to try extracting information using the First Knight's methods, doubting their effectiveness and challenging him to follow through. Kane smiled and explained his approach, highlighting that First Knights do not use threats, torture, or caution during interrogations, instead, they use artifacts. He revealed an artifact that paralyzes the mind, compelling the subject to divulge information. With slight adjustments, it can also erase memories of the past few hours, ensuring the subject forgets the interrogation and their betrayal. Kane proposed this method as fair, as he would obtain the information without the Imperial Hound feeling guilty about betraying the Empire. He then asked the Imperial Hound about their final goal. The scene then shifted back to the gate, where Jake expressed frustration upon encountering a dungeon immediately after barely passing through the gorge. Confused by the gate's challenges, Nokia sought clarification from Roll. Roll explained that the dungeon had formed from the mana of the gate, and it appeared to still be in the process of forming. He warned that if the gate's rank rose to sea, the terrain itself would undergo significant changes. Therefore, they needed to act swiftly. If they didn't defeat the Guardian soon, it could pose a serious threat. Josh raised concerns about the dungeon potentially engulfing the gate's terrain, which could lead to monsters of a much higher level pouring into the capital. Jake, understanding the urgency of the situation, urged Roll to proceed quickly, addressing him as master. Roll, however, found the timing and circumstances suspicious. He noted that such a challenging gate had appeared shortly before that incident. He reflected that gates of Surank or higher typically required significant time to conquer and that this dungeon seemed particularly formidable. He suspected that someone might be deliberately trying to tie down their knighthood to this gate, possibly as a distraction or trap. As Roll contemplated the suspicious timing of the gate's appearance, Jake interrupted his thoughts, addressing him as master and asking if there was a problem. Roll brushed it off reassuring the group to take their time to scout the area and prepare thoroughly before entering. He emphasized the uncertainty of the unfolding situation and the need for ample preparation. All the members acknowledged Roll's instructions, expressing their understanding. Roll questioned himself, wondering if he was overthinking things. Despite his suspicions, he acknowledged that they couldn't leave the gate, and decided to focus on breaking through it as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, from a distance, two figures observed them, who are Imperial Hounds. As the first knights entered the dungeon, Josh held onto the magic lamp, while Jake remarking on the dungeon's size and eerie silence, speculating it might be due to its incomplete state. Pierce cautioned against dropping their guard, sensing a latent danger despite the apparent quietness. Josh asked Philip if dungeons typically looked like this and marveled at how such structures could form naturally. Philip explained that dungeons come in various types, with rune-type dungeons like the current one being larger. He described dungeons as formations created by a concentration of mana, 
allowing their shapes to change and potentially spawn monsters. Philip emphasized the unpredictability of dungeons and urged everyone to stay vigilant. Nokia, observing the environment, was fascinated by the pillars and the magical moss growing on them. She asked if she could collect samples, noting the moss's reputed magical properties. Josh remarked on Nokia's calm demeanor, contrasting it with their own nerves. Philip commented that Nokia's composure stemmed from her strength. Roel, meanwhile, noted the dungeon's unusual aspects. Despite its size and potential rank C growth, the perceived danger level was surprisingly low. He sensed an unnaturally rigid flow of mana, suggesting someone had artificially suppressed the dungeon's magical power. Josh then spotted something on the wall and alerted Roel. Roel swiftly turned on as Josh pointed out a magic circle engraved on the dungeon wall. Josh asked if dungeons naturally formed such things, prompting Nokia to identify it as a magic suppression spell. Roel wondered why such a spell would be present in this dungeon, sensing something amiss. He immediately warned his knights to be cautious, suspecting a trap. Suddenly, a group of attackers descended upon them with swords drawn, forcing the first knights to dodge explosions. Jake voiced confusion over the sudden attack. Meanwhile, Imperial Hounds blocked their path, with their leader acknowledging the knights' unexpected arrival and thanking them for making their infiltration easier. Seeing the Imperial Hounds, Roll realized they had infiltrated the dungeon and likely suppressed its mana flow. He questioned their motives and swiftly drew his sword from his inventory, preparing to confront them and determined to uncover their plans. Gerald D. Rubin returned to Rubin Kingdom Palace and encountered his older brother, Herdian D. Rubin, the kingdom's third prince. Herdian reminded Gerald about the order to stay within the palace, questioning why he had ventured outside. Gerald explained that he had to discuss urgent matters with Count Randall regarding the gates, apologizing for not following the order. He acknowledged the necessity of facing the consequences and promised to inform the king himself. Herdian reassured Gerald that there was no need for immediate consequences, expressing confidence that their father, the king, would understand the urgency of the situation. However, he advised Gerald to use messengers or call meetings in the future, emphasizing the king's absolute orders. Gerald respectfully accepted his brother's advice, affirming that he understood and would comply with proper protocol moving forward. As Herdian D. Reuben walked away, he pondered when Gerald had started concerning himself with the gates, wondering if the king or another brother had influenced him. A girl accompanying him clarified that Gerald acted on his own, likely inspired by his classmate Roel Ashton's achievements. She asked if they should take any action. Herdian instructed her to secretly summon Viscount Plank for a discussion. Meanwhile, inside the dungeon, the Imperial Hound group leader taunted the First Knights, mocking them for falling into the trap and confirming the rumors about Roel's fascination with Gates. The First Knights, now aware of their opponent's identity, became nervous. Jake angrily called the Imperial Hound's weirdos for hiding in the dungeon, while Philip questioned if their plan was to lure the conquest squad. The leader smugly replied that regardless of their thoughts, the knights had indeed walked into his trap. Raoul felt something was off, questioning why the Imperial Hounds had set a trap with only a few members and no high-ranking personnel. He nervously considered a possibility and turned to Nokia, asking about the effectiveness of the magic circle for mana restriction. Nokia confirmed that it was a powerful high-class restriction spell, further enhanced by a dagger artifact in the center. Roel deduced that the magic circle had restricted the mana within the gate, causing the condensed mana to enhance the gate's rank. Nokia agreed with his assessment. Roel pondered whether the Imperial Hounds had manipulated the gate's rank to lure them in and if there was another purpose behind it, given the small number of enemies present. Jake taunted the Imperial Hounds, questioning their confidence in defeating the First Knights. The Imperial Hound group leader retorted, asserting that they were stronger than the Kingdom's forces and that their bait had successfully lured the First Knights into the trap. Hearing the Imperial Hound leader refer to themselves as bait, Roel nervously pondered the implications. Jake, 
Philip and Josh charged at the Imperial Hounds, with Jake sarcastically hoping they weren't trapped just for a conversation. Philip swiftly defeated two Imperial Hounds, Jake took down another two, and Pierce eliminated two more. Josh defeated the group leader, who dropped to his knees, and his sword falls to the ground, and admitted he expected defeat but hoped for a better outcome. Philip questioned why the leader had planned such a stupid trap if he anticipated failure. The leader cryptically replied that everything was going according to plan. Meanwhile, Nokia approached the magic circle and noticed another spell cast on the artifact, realizing there was more to the trap. As Nokia recognized the spell cast on the artifact, she started trembling. The Imperial Hound leader declared that they were not weak and that death was part of their plan, proclaiming their success for the Emperor. He then began to tremble and foam at the mouth. At that moment, the magic circle activated. Jake turned to Roel, asking what was happening, while Roel looked toward Nokia. Nokia explained that the artifact had a self-destruct spell chain. When the caster died, the restricted mana would be released, causing the condensed mana in the dungeon to go berserk. A loud noise echoed through the dungeon, causing everyone to turn towards it. Jake asked Roel about the noise and Roel, feeling nervous, sensed something approaching from deep within the dungeon. Soon, they saw a large number of armored balls rushing toward them. Philip remarked on the gravity of the situation. Roel shouted that there were too many balls and ordered everyone to run and escape the gate. They followed Roel as he led them, urging them to run faster towards the gate's entrance which he indicated was just past a set of stairs. Meanwhile the gate guardian stood before the dungeon entrance, weapon in hand, blocking their escape route. At Reuben Kingdom Palace, Herdian D. Reuben, the kingdom's third prince, apologized to Viscount Jerry D. Plank for the short notice and the difficulty of entering the palace secretly due to the king's order to restrict entry and exit. He emphasized the necessity of the meeting to prevent their plan from falling apart. Plank, the kingdom's financial director, reassured Herdian that it was his fault for causing concern. Herdian dismissed the formalities and directly asked about the execution of Plank's plan. Plank reminded Herdian of his initial advice about the need for patience to achieve his ambitions. Frustrated, Herdian expressed his unwillingness to wait any longer having risked everything for the plan. Plank then shared that he was pleased to bring good news, finally delivering results that justified Herdian's patience. Herdian asked Plank what he meant by good news. Plank cryptically replied that Herdian would see the results of patience after tonight. Meanwhile, as Roel and his team ran towards the exit, Roel announced that the exit was visible but abruptly stopped as he noticed a monster blocking their path. Jake exclaimed in shock asking what the monster was, while Philip speculated it might be the gate guardian. Roel, feeling nervous, wondered why the guardian was in that place. His thoughts were interrupted by a system window displaying an urgent quest, eliminate the gate guardian. Rank the objective, eliminate the gate guardian that appeared with the monster wave. Reward, 28,000 experience coins and a random B rank material box. Roel continued to think anxiously, lamenting the timing and realizing that if they could reach the valley, they could use the narrow path to escape the gate. He pondered if facing the gate guardian at the dungeon entrance was part of a larger plan, regretting his earlier arrogance. As they heard the approaching footsteps of armored boars from behind, Jake informed the group that they had caught up to them. Philip expressed concern to Roel, noting that they were likely to be surrounded soon. Roel, feeling the pressure, considered the elite guardian as a formidable raid monster that couldn't be quickly eliminated. He wondered about his options, realizing that using Regnator's power could potentially eradicate both the monsters and the guardian, but he was unsure about his ability to control it fully, which could endanger his companions. Noticing Rawls and ease, Nokia took action by retrieving something from her pocket and bravely stepping forward to confront the armored balls. This unexpected move puzzled everyone, prompting Josh to inquire about her intentions. Meanwhile, Nokia revealed a bottle of potion and assured Roel that she would handle the monsters. 
She then commanded the knights to assist Roll in clearing a path forward. Roll, alarmed at Nokia's bold move to confront the approaching armored boars alone, shouted out to her, expressing concern that she couldn't handle them by herself. However, his surprise grew as he noticed the potion she carried. Reacting quickly, Roll instructed his knights to stay clear of Nokia and prevent the Guardian from reaching her, emphasizing that while it might not be the safest approach, they needed to trust Nokia's judgment. As Nokia began to use the potion, a mixture of potion and mana started to emit from the bottle. The armored boars closed in on her, poised to attack. Undeterred, Nokia began chanting in a language unfamiliar to the others. Soon, a powerful magic began to manifest, freezing the armored boars in their tracks. The knights and Roa alike were stunned by this display of magic. Roll realized that Nokia had already attained a remarkable level of skill, employing a form of magic known as the Dragon's Tongue. This ancient magic was considered the highest form below that of her gods, allowing her to wield draconic magic with incredible proficiency. This video comprises all the chapters released until today. The 16th part of this manhua concludes here. The 17th part will be shared once there are at least 3 to 4 new chapters released. To show your support consider subscribing to the channel. Catch you in the next episode.